Well, good morning, men. I want to welcome you to a third week of our men's study. We're so grateful that you could join us again this week. My name is Robbie. I'm one of the pastors here, and it's a joy to jump into this series with everyone. I hope you're finding the rhythm of meeting in your groups. And as we come around God's Word this morning, I just want to connect a little bit what we did last week to what we're doing this week. Last week, if you remember, we were in Luke 5, and Brent was talking about this miraculous catch of fish where Jesus uh, confronts Peter, who's had a tough night fishing, and says, I want you to throw the nets out again. And when he does, Peter obeys Jesus' word, and what happens is spectacular. Uh, Peter ends up bringing in more fish than he's probably ever seen in one place. And Peter's overwhelmed by who Jesus is and his own sin. And what he ends up doing is asking the Lord to depart from him because he's a sinful man. And so he sees the glory of Jesus. He sees his sin. And, and it's this picture of faith as he comes to Christ and Christ invites him to follow him. And Peter and the other disciples actually leave everything behind and go and follow Jesus. That's one picture of faith. In the next passage after that one, uh, we have a leper coming to Jesus. And he says, as he approaches Jesus and falls down and begs Jesus, if you will, you can make me clean. And the Lord touches this untouchable person and makes him clean. And we have another picture of faith. Now, as we move into today's lesson, we focus on this next section in Luke 5. We'll see another picture of faith. And it's also a preview of the kingdom that Jesus came to inaugurate. So follow along with me as we read Luke 5 verses 15 through 26. But now even more, the report about him went abroad and great crowds gathered to hear him and to be healed of their infirmities. But he would withdraw to desolate places and pray. On one of those days, as he was teaching, Pharisees and teachers of the law were sitting there who had come from every village of Galilee and from Jerusalem. And the power of the Lord was with him to heal. And behold, some men were bringing on a bed a man who was paralyzed, and they were seeking to bring him in and lay him before Jesus. But finding no way to bring him in because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and let him down with his bed through the tiles into the midst before Jesus. And when he saw their faith, he said, man, your sins are forgiven. And the scribes and the Pharisees began to question, saying, who is this who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? And when Jesus perceived their thoughts, he answered them, Why do you question in your hearts? Which is easier to say, Your sins are forgiven you, or to say, Rise and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the man who was paralyzed, I say to you, Rise, pick up your bed, and go home. And immediately he rose up before them and picked up what he had been lying on and went home glorifying God. And amazement seized them all and they glorified God and were filled with awe saying, we have seen extraordinary things today. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this portion of your word. We pray that you would help us to see Jesus and show us what it looks like to come to him and trust in him alone. Holy Spirit, teach us your word and by your grace, help us to apply it to our lives. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So I want you to see a couple things today. And the first one is that this story gives us a picture of faith. It's important to know that faith is more than believing that Jesus exists. Everyone sitting there that day in Luke 5 believed that Jesus existed because they could hear him. They could see him. If they could get close enough, they could touch him and maybe even smell him. Jesus' fame was spreading like wildfire and people were coming to see him from all around. Some came with excitement because they, they wanted to see something amazing. And some came with their needs. They wanted to be healed like this paralytic. And some came with suspicion. They actually wanted to undermine what Jesus was doing. See, people come to Jesus for all kinds of reasons. That's still true. The question then and now is, are we coming to Jesus in faith? James says that the demons actually believe in God and shudder. So clearly faith is more than believing that Jesus exists. It's more than going through the motions and being in the right places where a Christian should be. So we're not sitting in the room with all these people in Luke 5, but we're, we're sitting in virtual rooms or perhaps gathering with a group of men. And as we gather, what does Jesus see? Does he see a genuine faith? What does that even mean? 
Faith is coming to Jesus and trusting in him alone. That's the essence of it. And we can start to see this when we focus on two different groups of people in the passage. First, the religious leaders and then the paralytic and his friends. So let's talk about the scribes and the Pharisees for a moment. These religious leaders, they, they come from all over, some from as far as Jerusalem, and they come to see Jesus. And we come to see what's going on in their hearts. When Jesus tells the paralytic that his sins are forgiven, what happens? Do they rejoice and celebrate? No, they actually question and start to deliberate. They accuse Jesus of blasphemy, of claiming to do what only God can do. According to their law, blasphemy is a crime, a sin worthy of death. So Jesus has come to give life. And here the religious leaders are plotting his death. Clearly they believe that he exists, but they don't trust him. They doubt his identity. They question his intentions. They reject his authority. The religious leaders, they want power. They want control. They want wealth. They want to be known as people who do the right thing. But at the end of the day, they don't want Jesus. They come to him, but they don't trust him. They're face to face actually with the King of Kings, but they want to build their own kingdoms. Now let's talk about the paralytic and his friends. We don't know how long this man has been paralyzed. We don't know how many prayers he's prayed. We don't know how many treatments he's tried, but he and his friends have heard about Jesus. And on this day, they wake up and they decide to go do something about it. They're coming to Jesus and they're not gonna let anything or anyone get in their way. It's actually in Mark's version of this story, Mark 2, verse 3. We learn it was four friends who were carrying this paralyzed man to Jesus. So with one friend on each corner of the bed, they pick him up, they carry him through town or who knows how far, and they find the house where Jesus is teaching. So imagine the friends as they approach. They're, they're sweaty, their arms are aching, but they made it, they're here. And imagine now the man on his bed. Is he excited? Is he embarrassed? Is he worried someone's going to rebuke him for bothering the teacher? They get close enough to realize that they can't get close enough to Jesus. They're late. The seats are taken. There's no room at the front. So what do they do? Do they give up? Do they say, we'll come back tomorrow? No, they actually climb up the steps on the side of the house, which wouldn't be unusual to have back then. They get to the roof and they start to tear open a hole in the roof and they lower their friend down into the room. In his commentary on Luke, Philip Ryken says, there's a time for waiting to see if God will open a door, but there's also a time to get inside, even if it means going through the roof to get there. And so there are these pivotal moments when faith calls for bold courage and Abraham leaves his home and Moses goes and confronts Pharaoh and David charges Goliath and these four friends tear a hole in the roof. So whatever Jesus was teaching, you know, that lesson's over now. All eyes are on the paralytic on his bed, on the floor in front of Jesus. And occasionally people are probably looking up to see the sweaty faces of his friends looking down through the hole in the roof. And what happens next? Look at verse 20. It says, And when Jesus saw their faith, he said, Man, your sins are forgiven. Isn't this shocking? Think about what gets Jesus' attention. It's not their appearance. It's not their talent, it's not their net worth, not their reputation, not their personality, not any of the things that usually get our attention. When Jesus saw their faith, faith is what gets Jesus' attention. And the essence of faith is coming to Christ and trusting in him alone. And that's what Jesus sees when he looks at the paralytic and his friends. They had nowhere else to go, no other hope. So they came to him. They didn't know what to do, but they had this feeling. They trusted that Jesus would know what to do. So they came to him. Listen to how Charles Spurgeon talks about faith. He says, to believe is to trust or lean upon Christ Jesus. In other words, to give up self-reliance and to rely upon the Lord Jesus. You might've heard this a little bit last week when Brent talked about Peter and his gifts as a fisherman. And Jesus is basically asking him to give up on self-reliance and trust Jesus. 
So this faith is a strange thing. It's more than just believing that an airplane can somehow get up in the air and fly. It's sitting down in our seat and entrusting our life to the pilot. It's more than believing that Jesus is a savior for sinners. It's coming to him and trusting him to be our savior, to forgive our sin. So it's not ultimately about the strength of our faith which can be as small as a mustard seed, Jesus says, and still move mountains. It's about the object of our faith, the Lord God Almighty himself, the one in whom we believe. So Spurgeon adds, the Lord always owns a faith which comes toward him, however lame it may be. And like the paralytic, we may not even be able to walk or reach out a hand, but the arm of the Lord is not too short to save us. That's what Isaiah says in Isaiah 59, 1. So as we think about this picture of faith, it's helpful to see ourselves in these different characters. So here are a few questions to examine our faith. How are we sometimes like the religious leaders? Well, we're like them when we reject Jesus' authority over the world and over our lives. And that may say, we wouldn't, we would never do that. (laughs) But it's actually pretty easy to do. In the midst of a pandemic and an election cycle, it's easy to say, Lord, I don't trust the way you're running the world and my life. We're like the religious leaders when we come to Jesus with questions, but really we think we already have all the answers and we're really just trying to prove him wrong or mess with him. We're like the religious leaders when we know a lot about Jesus, but we refuse to trust him, to die to ourselves and follow him. You know, we can be more like the religious leaders than we think. And may the Lord save us from being modern day Pharisees. How's the Lord calling us to see ourselves like the paralytic? This man lies paralyzed before Jesus. He's helpless. He's powerless. He's at Christ's mercy. We may be healthy physically, but when it comes to sin in our lives, we're paralyzed. There's nothing we can really do about it. Are we humble enough to admit it? Lord, I can't heal myself. I can't forgive myself. I need a miracle. I'm coming to you. It may be so bad that, our, that we need our friends to bring us to Jesus. So do we welcome friends like that into our lives? Like the paralytic, the Lord wants us to give up on everything else and to come to him and to trust him to save us. How's the Lord calling us to be like the paralytic's friends? Well, like these four friends, we're obviously called to have compassion for people who are physically broken. And there's a lot of that going on around us right now. We have an opportunity to make the love of Christ real for those who are hurting. So let's not underestimate the power of loving people well in their distress. Like these four friends, we're also called to carry people to Jesus. How would the paralytic meet Jesus if his friends didn't carry him there? This is one of the simplest pictures of evangelisms that we have. The Lord is calling us to come together with friends and carry people to Jesus. Now there are all kinds of obstacles. We're busy. It's awkward. We don't know how to do it. What will people think? But the Lord is calling us to break through every obstacle and bring people to Jesus. It starts with praying for them, bringing them before the only one who can save them. But beyond prayer, we can talk to people in the front yard. We can have them over for dinner. We can invite them to small group. We can bring them to church. There's so many ways we can help people get into a situation where they might hear about, learn about, catch a glimpse of Jesus. And if it's hard for us to do it by ourselves, how much sweeter to come together with friends for this all important mission. So whom is the Lord putting on your heart? Where's there an opportunity to bring someone to Jesus who might not meet him otherwise? And who could join you in carrying people to Jesus in prayer and in other ways? So I want you to think about this. When it comes to carrying people to Jesus, whatever it costs, even if we have to fix a hole in the roof, it's worth it if we can help our friends have an encounter with Jesus Christ. 
So what the Lord gives us here is a picture of faith, but he also gives us a preview of the kingdom and the kingdom is greater than we expect. It was December of 1987, the Chicago Bulls were uh, in Salt Lake City to play the Utah Jazz. And you can actually see this on YouTube if you wanna look it up, but this is an amazing sequence. The Bulls have the ball, Michael Jordan's posting up on the left block. John Stockton is guarding him on his right shoulder. So the post pass comes, Jordan is gonna catch it here. Stockton Stockton comes around and tries to steal it this way. John Stockton misses the pass. Jordan catches it, gathers in one motion, jumps up, dunks the ball on John Stockton. John Stockton, 6'1", 170 pounds. And so Jordan's running back down the court and some fan yells, hey, Jordan, pick on someone your own size. And so literally the next time down the court, Bulls get the ball, Pippen outlet pass to Jordan. Jordan takes one dribble, gathers, elevates, dunks the ball over Mel Turpin. Mel Turpin, 6'11", 240 pounds. And so Jordan turns around running back down the court again. He looks over at the fan and says, is he big enough? You see, it wasn't smart to challenge the authority of Michael Jordan. He was greater than those fans knew. And it wasn't smart to challenge the authority of Jesus because he was greater than the religious leaders knew. Now think about it. If Jesus had just healed this man, it would have been like the other miracles. You know, the religious leaders wouldn't have liked it, more good press for Jesus, but at least they wouldn't have to deal with this whole forgiveness of sins thing but Jesus dunks on them with the forgiveness of sins. And then he dunks on them again by healing the paralytic. If you think about how this played out, almost certainly the man and his friends came looking for the physical healing. When Jesus said, man, your sins are forgiven. What do you think they thought? Jesus, that's great, but we didn't actually come here for that. What Jesus does is he gives them something far greater than what they expected. It would be like going to a farm to table restaurant for a meal and the waitress ends up giving you the farm. They went for a physical problem, healing for a physical problem that was destroying this man's life on earth. And what happens is Jesus delivers healing for a spiritual problem that would destroy this man's life for eternity. Jesus addresses his sin first. And this is how it works in the kingdom of God. Jesus does things greater than we expect. He's able to do more than we ask or imagine according to his power at work within us. But clearly forgiving this man's sins trips everybody up and Jesus knows it. Look at the next verses, 22 and 23. When Jesus perceived their thoughts, he answered them, why do you question in your hearts? Which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven you or to say, rise and walk? Which is easier? It's an interesting question, is it? Because in a sense, both statements are easy to say. Talk is cheap. Anyone can say, your sins are forgiven or rise and walk. But from another angle, both are hard. Who really has the power to heal a paralyzed man? Or who could die on a cross as the perfect sacrifice for sin to pay the penalty and then be able to say, your sins are forgiven? The crowd probably thinks it's easy to talk about sins and it's hard to heal a broken body. You know, anyone can promise forgiveness, but who knows if it has really been granted. But if someone tells me rise and walk and I'm still paralyzed, the game is up. You didn't do it. I think Jesus actually knows the harder part because he knows there's a cross coming in his future. So in asking the question, Jesus is aiming at the religious leaders' hearts. It's about authority. They don't think he's God. They don't think he has the authority. They want to be the authority. So Jesus decides to put that fire out by pouring gasoline on it. Look at verse 24. But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So why did Jesus call himself the Son of Man? Is this just a sneaky way, kind of like athletes, to refer to himself in the third person? No, it's not a throwaway phrase. When the religious leaders hear son of man, their minds would run to passages like Daniel 7, 13 through 14, where it says, I saw in the night visions and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man. And he came to the ancient of days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. Jesus is claiming to be that guy, 
the son of man. Question is authority and he doesn't back down. No, he actually comes back with everlasting dominion and a kingdom that shall not be destroyed. See, Jesus doesn't perform miracles from a place of insecurity like he needs to somehow prove himself. Now, Jesus performs miracles to demonstrate the glory and goodness of his kingdom, which is breaking into the world. Healing the paralytic is another demonstration that Jesus is the son of man, the king with authority over all things, including sin and death. So in Luke 5, 24, Jesus goes on, but that you may know that the son of man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the man who was paralyzed, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed and go home. However you see it, now Jesus has done the easier thing and the harder thing. He's given the paralytic the greater gift of forgiveness and a right relationship with God. And now he gives him a healed body. In this season, when we come to Jesus, what are we seeking? Because 2020 has done a number on all of us. Business is tough. Marriage is tough. Singleness is tough. Parenting is tough. School is tough. Sin is tough. So much is broken. So much needs healing. And these other things get all the headlines and we can forget if we're in Christ, we already have the greatest gift, the forgiveness of sins, a new heart, fellowship with Jesus Christ. And if the Lord never healed or fixed another thing in our lives, forgiveness of sins should be enough. Do we believe that? But remembering the greatest gift should encourage us because if the Lord has already done the greater thing, should we not believe that he can do the lesser thing? Consider this beautiful new lyric from John Newton. He says, Thou art coming to a king, large petitions with thee bring, for his grace and power are such, none can ever ask too much. It's an encouragement to pray bold and dependent prayers. If there ever was a year for bold prayers, 2020 is that year. So we're praying to a king large petitions with us we should bring. So we're talking about this preview of the kingdom. We're talking about how it's greater than we could ever expect, but it also includes the forgiveness of sins and the renewal of all creation. That's what we see in this little snapshot in Luke 5. In, in this quotation, Jared Wilson talks about miracles and he says, the miracles of Jesus are acts of heavenly normalization which is to say they're isolated snapshots of the transformation of the broken world to the way it will someday be. That's basically saying that these miracles are these moments when everything that's not the way it was supposed to be seems to be set right again. For a moment, we see his kingdom come, his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And we're reminded the kingdom is already here and the kingdom is also not yet fully here. So we love what we see and we long for more. It's really hard to have a big enough vision of the kingdom of God. Because when we think about the kingdom of God, different Christians focus on different things. Some Christians focus more on the forgiveness of sins. Some focus more on the way the Lord transforms society or culture. Some focus more on the end of the story, the new heavens and the new earth. And we all seem to struggle to keep the whole spectacular picture in view. But the kingdom preview in Luke 5 reminds us that it's not one or the other. It's actually all of the above. These different aspects of the kingdom exist side by side in Scripture, even in the same books. Just think about the book of Isaiah. In Isaiah 53, 5 and 6, we, we know these verses well from hundreds of years before Christ came. It says, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. So here we see the focus on forgiveness of sins and personal salvation. The king came to lay down his life for our sins. You go forward to Isaiah 61, 1 and 2, and we read, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God. 
This is the passage that Jesus quotes in Luke 4, just a chapter before, where he's in Nazareth and he stands up and reads that and he says, today in your presence, the scripture is fulfilled. And he gets run out of town because they don't like it. But the point is, this is a picture of the kingdom that's coming and how it's going to change things for everybody. And so what do we see in some of these stories? Jesus bringing good news to people who are poor, binding up people who are broken, setting them free from things like paralysis. And so this is an aspect of the kingdom as well. And then you go forward to Isaiah 65, 17. And it says, for behold, I create new heavens and a new earth and the former things shall not be remembered or come into mind. And we have there, you know, a little preview of what we hear more about in Revelation 21, which Paul Goebel mentioned a few weeks ago, that there's a whole new creation coming. And, and, and this is the first fruits. Jesus is the first fruits. And, and the world is, is being made new. And that is an incredible aspect of the kingdom as well. It's hard for us to keep all of that together, but that's all of what we're talking about when we talk about the kingdom of God. Theologian uh, Herman Bavink writes, summarizes it this way. He says, the essence of the Christian religion consists in this, that the creation of the Father, devastated by sin, is restored in the death of the Son of God and recreated by the Holy Spirit into the kingdom of God. Isn't that a beautiful way to tell the story? Because we have creation, fall, and redemption. We have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We have the finished work of Christ and his death and resurrection. And we have the kingdom of God. Before Jesus dies and rises again, these miracles give us a tiny glimpse of this cosmic plan. The paralytic sins are forgiven and his body is restored. And in a moment, the devastation of sin is undone and creation is restored. The kingdom has come and we long for the day when the Lord will set everything right. So how does our passage end? The last couple of verses says, immediately the paralytic rose up before them and picked up what he'd been lying on and went home glorifying God. And amazement seized them all and they glorified God and were filled with awe saying, we have seen extraordinary things today. And so he comes to Jesus in faith. He trusts in Jesus alone. He, he meets the king and he experiences the power of the kingdom. And what we need to see is that a genuine encounter with Jesus always results in glory to God. When Jesus works in our lives, he gets the glory and we get the joy. So the former paralytic glorifies God every step. Just imagine every step he takes brings glory to God. Every word of his testimony as he shares it brings glory to God. He probably returns to his home and tells his family and friends about the glory of God. He's the man who came, carried on his bed, and he walked out carrying his bed. All glory to God. And his friends certainly glorify God. Their prayers for their friend have been answered. And then some, they did what they could. They brought him to Jesus and Jesus did the rest. When the Lord uses us in his great rescue plan, all glory to God. And certainly the strangers in the crowd glorify God. They came to hear some teaching, right? And they witnessed a miracle. They saw the king bringing his kingdom as savior and healer, all glory to God. Here's another quotation from Philip Ryken's commentary. He says, do you want to see that glory in your own life? Then come to Jesus in faith, trusting him for healing and forgiveness. He will touch your sin sick soul and cleanse your unholy heart. His healing compassion is not just for you, but also for the people you love well enough to bring to him. Your hands are the hands God uses to reach out to people no one else is willing to touch. Your arms are the arms he uses to carry people to Christ. Your voice is the voice he uses to sing his glorious praise. And I read that this week and I thought, yes, I love that. I want to be about that. And yet I want to close with a personal story because if you're like me, 2020 has been quite a year. Sometimes you just hear a message and you don't know what to do with it. And to be honest, sometimes we just teach a message and we don't know what to do with it. So from a personal standpoint, I wanna share with you how I'm processing this passage. 
I know we're not alone, but 2020 has been a really hard year for our family, for Anne and me and our boys. And just to name a few broad categories, we've experienced disruption, cancellations, exhaustion, family health crises. We've had challenging work with very irregular hours. Uh, with our boys, we've done more virtual school or no school than school in person. And the other night, Anne and I were just sitting there talking and just being honest about how we're doing. And um, one thing we realized is just how much we need our friends. And it dawned on me, that's my way into the story because we are like the paralytic on the mat. And we're not paralyzed physically and we don't necessarily need our sins to be forgiven. We know Jesus, but so much, we just feel powerless. We feel exhausted. Uh, we feel paralyzed this year. And so we need our friends to carry us to Jesus. And, and in many ways they have. People have prayed for us. People have brought meals. Uh, we've had conversations. People have checked on us. And we're not always good at asking for help, but the Lord is putting on our, on our heart, we want to change. We want to reach out to our friends and invite them in and let them know that we need them to help us, uh, to, to carry us to Jesus. And we want to do the same for them. And then I also see myself as a disciple who needs to follow Jesus and escape to a quiet place to pray and be with the Father. You might not have seen it, but the second verse we read, uh, Luke 5, 16 says, but Jesus would withdraw to desolate places and pray. It's in the midst of his ministry flourishing and blowing up and the crowds are pushing in on him and it's crazy. It's 2020 crazy. And Jesus, it says, would withdraw to desolate places and pray. That's what we need. We need friends who will carry us to Jesus. We need to help carry our friends to Jesus. And we need to get alone with the Father. We need to get alone with Jesus. We need to get alone with the Holy Spirit that we might commune with God. Because otherwise we're just not going to make it. Jesus knew that. And that's why he would escape. He didn't just want to go and do miraculous things. Uh, he actually, I think more than anything, wanted to be with his father. That's where his power came from. That's where uh, his life flowed from. And so if that's encouraging to you, that's how I'm thinking about this passage. These are the things that help me think about coming to Jesus and trusting him, trusting him to be the king who has the authority uh, to save me and to heal me. And I pray that you would find him to be your king as well. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the opportunity to study it. And we thank you that it still speaks to us. Lord, we pray that you would give us grace to know what it looks like to come to you in faith, to trust that you are the king, that your kingdom has come and it continues to come. And one day it will come in fullness that we might believe that you have all the authority uh, to heal us, to save us and to make all things new. Bless our conversations as we talk about your word and what you're teaching us. And again, give us grace, Holy Spirit, to apply these things to our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a great discussion. We'll see you next week.